And the referee again checking his watch. And, and there, there it goes. goes. The final whistle. Carlos Morrison will wait inside the box for this from Martin Knapp. And a header on it there. And that might have been it. That was a goal for Canada. The header was adjacent to Boss. One last chance for Canada. Sophie Schmidt takes a reflection. Not the sun. There's that. Welcome to the Canada Soccer Nation podcast. My name is Jason DeVos. I'm the Director of Development with Canada Soccer. And Brad Fougere has abandoned me today, so I'm, I'm on my own. I think it's it's only taken Brad, what, 13, 14 episodes now to, to realize that he wants to have nothing to do with me and is, is fed up with me. I'm actually surprised it's taken him this long to, to pull the plug. But uh, no, Brad, unfortunately, is not available today. So I'm on my own and I'll be having two conversations with our two guests uh, individually, which are going to be great because they're both people people that I have a lot of respect for and uh, and I've learned a lot from over the years. So we'll get started with our first interview and uh, pleased to to welcome uh, Mr. Drew Ferguson to the podcast. Uh, Drew, if you're not familiar with his playing career, had an extensive professional playing career in North America and uh, we'll get him to talk a little bit about his overseas experiences as well. Uh, he got his start with the Vancouver Whitecaps before moving on to play with the Edmonton Drillers, Chicago Sting, New York Cosmos, amongst other teams. Uh, he was capped 10 times for Canada's men's national team, scored once, and was the player coach of the Kitchener Spirit from 1990 to 91, where he had to deal with a, a slow, lanky 17-year-old kid who uh, was playing as a center back for the first time. And uh, and that's when my my path first crossed uh, Drew's. But he's also served as the head coach of Canada's Para Soccer Program since 2004 and recently oversaw his 100th game in charge of the program, which is an impressive feat by any standard. Drew, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for taking the time to chat with us today. Yeah, thanks, Jason, for uh, having me. Um, talk a little bit about your 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 background in the game, Drew. You you were born and raised in in Powell River, British Columbia. But when when did you first realize that uh, you were good at kicking a soccer ball around? And, and when did you fall in love with the game? Yeah, uh, pretty early age. I think probably I would guess what I, by the time I was seven or eight, I'd sort of made my mind up. I wanted to be a professional footballer. Uh, parents are Scottish background, so I don't know. I don't know if you remember the old shoot magazine, yes. and goal magazine, yes, in England, match which, as uh, well was the other one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. So those were those were shipped to me by the by the week or by the month, and I'd be reading those for uh, from the age seven to ten, eleven years old. So um, yeah, and uh, you know, you just I think you know most of us have had enough or fortunate enough to make it in that career. You, you tend to be, especially in a small town, maybe you tend to be maybe the better player or the, you know, you may be scoring more goals. And the next thing you know, you're 10 years old playing in the 15 year old league yeah. and uh, things like that. Uh, yeah, and it just turned out good. You know, I was fortunate enough to go to England. Jackie Charlton, uh, who just passed away, uh, uh, seeing me playing soccer in Vancouver at a Harry Christie uh, soccer camp. And he thought I was good enough to make the grades at Leeds United. So he, uh, he took me back there. I actually lived with Jackie the whole time I was wow. there. Wow. Um, then came back and played for the BC programs, the under 15s and 17s and 19s, uh, won a gold medal at the Canada Games, scoring five in Newfoundland, scoring five goals and, uh, turned professional soccer with the Vancouver Whitecaps. So that's kind of, uh, you know, I've been in the professional game or soccer at a high level since <laughs> seven, eight, nine, ten years old. It's funny. Uh, I have said this many times before, and I wonder if you have the same experience, but when you tell your story of, of going from. Powell River playing soccer as a seven-year-old to a 15-year-old to Leeds United and then the ensuing professional career that you had after that it it, it seems unbelievable doesn't it in a lot of ways uh, what was that like for you going from playing in British Columbia Powell River playing in Vancouver playing in a tournament to you know meeting one of the icons of of the game in the UK and uh, and then going to a, a storied clubs like 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 Leeds, that must have been a real culture shock for you. Yeah, it's it's. I think it was. I mean, there was probably uh, there's many nights at Christmas times and things like that where you're in a even you know in the house that's looking after you tend to find a little corner and start crying because you're missing your family yeah. and your friends at 15 years old. Yeah. And and uh, Jackie was great for the first basically seven days. He uh, would throw me in the car and take me down to Allen Road every day. And about probably the second week, it was. Uh, there's the bus stops, boy, on your own. So I spent uh, 
a lot of times crying on the roads because I couldn't find the right bus to get down Allen Road. But you, <laughs> you, you figured out how to grow up real fast when you're 15, 16 years old over there. And uh, I always tease, uh, I always tease. We've got a junior A hockey team here, and I always tease these players nowadays. They come over and they get billeted out and looked after, yeah. and, and they've come all the way from Saskatoon to Power River. Well, <laughs> going from Power to uh, England, <laughs> a bit of a different story, but uh, yeah, it makes you makes you learn up, it makes you grow up real fast. You grow up really fast, don't you? Uh, that's one of the yeah, one do. of the things that I struggled with when I first went over. And I was I was older than you. I didn't go over to the UK until I was sort of eighteen years old. But uh, this the the isolation, the loneliness it's it's a really tough thing to deal with. And uh, obviously, I played for you. I played alongside you, but you were the, the player coach at Kitchener Spirit in nineteen ninety one when I when I was a seventeen year old and. Uh, I've told people this story as well countless times. You know, when when I get parents asking me, you know, when when does my child need to specialize? When does my child need to play in the right position? I didn't play center back until that year with you as head coach. Uh, I I was playing in all these other different roles, as, probably because I wasn't good enough to make it in any of those other roles. But it wasn't until I was seventeen that I actually you know, found that position and, and, and found my way in the game. W- you know, when did you realize, you know, when did the penny drop for you that you could have a career in the game and, and you could, you could maybe make a living at this? Was it when you signed for the Whitecaps or did you have that confidence before then that you had what it took to make the grade? Well, I'll tell you a very funny story that uh, sort of made me grow up real fast as well as uh, back in the old North American soccer league in the late seventies. Uh, Tony Waiters had seen me playing in, in a game in Victoria and I came walking out of the dressing room as a whatever it was 19 year old or 18 year old with a with a beer in my hand as also everybody does from Paul River and uh, he, he came up and introduced himself to me and, uh, and I went to Vancouver the next day and signed a pro contract so I mean it just kind of happened just by I, I was playing a game in Vancouver in Victoria he was there scouting somebody else uh, but he left with me um, so off we went and then you know, I felt comfortable there, but the the funny contract was John Best was our general manager, if you remember John Best. And the next year, uh, we were negotiating a contract, and uh, it was a 5% increase. And I remember asking Tony Waiters to come support me when I went to meet John. And John, I said to him, it wasn't that happy. Well, not, I'm talking like I'm a 62, 62-year-old man versus a 19-year-old boy then. Uh, a little scared and said, you know, I don't think I can live on that money. And I, I sarcastically said that there is... My best friends were in the mill making more than that. <laughs> he told me, well, go work in the mill. So I signed the contract <laughs> and off I went. So, uh, yeah, you, you, you learn fast where you think you're somebody important, or you're somebody good, but you're not. You're, you're just another player. And then until you prove the business is done, uh, you know, you're going to fight for every step. And that's what I kind of did. I think I was a, I think I was probably a grinder most of my career and a very fit guy that ran and worked hard and put in on his days working every day. Brilliant. Brilliant. It's amazing, isn't it, though, when you look back on those days and the decisions that you made and uh, the reality is it was hard to make it as a professional footballer back then. You know, people maybe look at what money is earned in the game today, but at the top, at the highest level. And I think that that was the same case back then, but it wasn't like that, was it? You know, you, you traveled around and had uh, a wide variety of, of stops along your way. What, what was the most memorable team that you played for uh, in your professional playing career well it's it's funny because then there's there's different reasons for having your most memorable or memorable times in that so i mean if you look at the vancouver whitecaps they won the soccer bowl in 1979 uh and i always tell the story that if it wasn't for myself they wouldn't have won it because i was a i was a wearing number 23 and halfway through the season they sold me to edmonton drillers for a whopping thirty thousand dollars (laughs) <laughs> and and they brought in Alan Ball, and he was wearing number twenty three, my number. Hence they went and yeah. won, hence they went on and won the soccer ball. So I, <laughs> I think I played a big part in that role. So, but the Vancouver Whitecaps Very was, good. <laughs> the, the Whitecaps were a brilliant team. I mean, great people are there. Uh, and and then Edmonton Drillers, there's there's a player named Peter Nogley, the German. He's probably one of the best center backs I've even seen ever play. Never mind play with them. And and then yeah, yeah I mean, you know what? I love every single one of them, and it's. Uh, all the teams were great. I mean, I'm running around indoor Cosmos with Giorgio Canagli and the boys and, uh, you know, yeah. Chicago Stings and Carl Hine and the boys. So, uh, I mean, my, my favorite memories are from probably Edmonton because I was there for the four years, four and a half years. And, uh, you, you know, I was, uh, I won a scoring title there for North Americans and, uh, in a small city where they really appreciate their athletes. You were, 
you could walk around and with your wife or girlfriend or anybody else and get into restaurants for free back in those days, even though you weren't, you weren't a millionaire, but you were kind of living like a millionaire in Edmonton. It was kind of nice. Yeah. Actually. So it was, uh, yeah, those were probably my favorite four or five years. Cause it was outdoor and a beautiful big stadium, nice grass and, uh, and some super people. Yeah. You've been coaching Canada's para soccer team uh, for many years now. Um, you've, you've been in charge for over a hundred caps, a uh, hundred games uh, as, as head coach. Talk a little bit about the work you do in that program and, and why it's so important for uh, all ability soccer to be promoted more than it is right, the, right now at the moment. Yeah, I think it's, you know, I think I started taking that program over 2004 and the CSA started jumping on board, you know, 2005. Um, and it all started out with somebody just asking me if I wanted to run out and come out to Toronto and run a training session uh, for players with cerebral palsy. So I, I did take that, um, and probably within the first day of doing that, I thought if there's a job at this thing, I want to do it. And I, I mean, I was just come back from coaching uh, professionally in the CSL, et cetera, et cetera. And, and what I saw was I saw athletes that don't, they have a physical disability, no cognitive disability, but physical disability, and, but they don't act like they have a physical disability. And when they fell down or somebody tripped them or somebody kicked them, there was no rolling around on the field, make, making sure the TV cameras see you. And uh, they got up instantly, no matter how hard they were knocked down. And that just took took my breath away, looking, wow. And they've basically, I've been told by them many times, stop feeling sorry for me, right? I'm a big boy. And I, and I, I had to sort of learn to start treating them more like an athlete versus somebody with a disability. And, uh, and I get it now. And... And once I got that, and you look them right in the face and see what, how hard they are trying, and now we've got you know now we've got quality players, quality quality players from the early days. Uh, if somebody walked up and offered me a million a year for another program, I, I don't think I'd take it. That's just how much, that's how dedicated I'm to that program now. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's amazing how um, how connected you can become to your players when you're when you're working with good people and and having good people in your program. It's it's uh, it's absolutely key, and and I think it goes a long way towards the coach's enjoyment of the the job. And it is a hard job for sure. What, what's been the highlight for you? What, what's been the the top? I mean, you won a bronze medal at the the Para Pan American Games in in Rio in two thousand seven. What's been the, the the top moment for you? I think uh, you know I've told the story a few times. I mean, I mean the bronze medal in in Brazil was absolutely brilliant. Uh, you know, playing playing in front of sold out crowds, uh, beating the USA, won nothing in the in the bronze medal game. I mean, that was that was highlight maybe as a, as a team. Right? You know, last year our Sam Sharon won the in the World Cup in Seville last year. He won the MVP of the whole tournament. And last two years ago, our keeper won the Golden Gloves in a, in a major tournament. Um, so seeing them do so well, but but more importantly, I really get a kick out of some of the senior players now because when I first met some of them. Very shy, very quiet. Uh, I was probably still the old grumpy old coach that yelled and gave people a bit of crap once in a while. And <laughs> you were never like that, Fergie. <laughs> no. And they and sometimes they'd almost a few players would almost start crying, like you know. And I'm like, yeah, what what the heck have I done here? Like, um, and those those same. I mean, they they were so quiet. And uh, now those same players are we go to Brazil or Argentina they stay an extra week and they go hiking and traveling by themselves fly by themselves uh, just seeing the athlete mature from a quiet young person that was maybe going through years in school having a disability maybe being picked on a little bit maybe teased to I'm, I'm a grown man now and uh, you know I've seen three of them in fact just one of my players just the other day got married so I've seen four of my athletes got mar- get married over the years uh, so yeah, so watching them grow up, not just as soccer players, but as people is, uh, is kind of, I'm probably proud of that, but obviously proud of, of how good, how good the team was. I mean, at one time we were ranked right number nine in the world. We're 11 now, uh, out of 86 countries. That's pretty impressive for a, for a team from Canada. And, uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, just watching the boys, just watching the boys grow. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. There's a lot of clubs now in Canada who are running all abilities programs. For those who aren't and haven't started down that road yet, what's the first step? How can they implement a program like that so that they can include athletes with dis- physical disabilities? 
Yeah, you know, and I, I think it's hard. It, it's uh, and you know the fellow Matt Greenwood, who's uh, spectacular at his job in doing those roles. Yeah, he is. Um, and every time, every time I get a phone call from a club, uh, I very politely pass them on to Matt, <laughs> and, <laughs> and Matt very politely very politely says thanks, Drew, <laughs> and then he starts working <laughs> with him again. So uh, yeah. he's the man that does it. Um, but yeah, it's huge. I mean, why why is it not soccer for everybody? I mean, it's it's fairly simple, right? Uh, if you watch FIFA and you watch everybody else, it's soccer for all. And that that word "all" is uh, is a big picture. And in Canada, it's uh, for just I say one team. You know, it should be for blind people. It should be for people uh, amputees. It should be for everybody. But in the para program, it's only uh, cerebral palsy and uh, recovering strokes. Uh, it's hard to find you know thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, seventy people to have run a club or something. So. What we've been talking to different clubs, you know, if you get two or three in Ontario, but they've got, I think, 13 clubs in Ontario do it now. You know, if you get one in BC or one in Vancouver, or one in Victoria, you know, maybe one in Nova Scotia. And we do talk to the people. We do talk to the technical directors. Um, but it's a big step, right, of uh, what they have to do. And, then, of course, as a national coach, you, you're you hoping they find stars for you. But realistically, when they're running their programs, you might not find your star from those programs. But as saying that, we're getting kids out playing soccer at all levels. Yeah, for sure. Um, Matt Greenwood is the executive director of Pickering Soccer Club, and he's someone we will absolutely have on the podcast in the future to talk about how to implement an all abilities program at the club level because he's done stellar work in that space. How do people get in touch with you? If there is a, a player out there who has the ability to play at a higher level, how do they contact you? How do they bring those players to your attention? Yeah, they, um, again, the hard part of that whole thing, Jason, is is the players at our level if they're playing able body soccer which is where we find most of our players in general nowadays um a lot of them don't know they have a disability right so what we've been trying to do lately is is in the last year or two is, is to try when i'm obviously i can't get to every club in every uh province every single year but we try to get to them over a year or two or three but basically is we're trying to teach the technical directors who hopefully can teach the coaches you know, what does an athlete that has cerebral palsy look like? You know, and a lot of times, uh, some of the kids might have had a stroke at birth, uh, but it's so minor that their parents don't even know. They know there's something wrong with the hand or something wrong with his foot a wee bit, but they don't know what the reason why that is. Um, so it's, it's some people, uh, Sam Giron, who uh, I'm sure you yes, heard of Sammy through the CSA absolutely. website, you know, he, he's just, he's just finished his fifth year at St. Fedex University. Uh, a, a Canadian Premier League team should be having a look at him and tell you the honest truth because he, he's, he's a quality player. Um, but we found him at a training camp in Ottawa. He was 12, 13 years old, I believe. And we were having a training camp in the same field and we were having a water break and myself and my assistant coach walked over just to watch a little bit of a game. And this little guy was dribbling by people and scoring goals and he said to me, he said, that kid's got some real palsy. And I, I didn't even see it in him. So we asked his coach if he had, if he knew he had a disability. No, he know nothing about it. Asked for his parents, and his dad was there. Went and talked to him, and there, there was the cerebral palsy national team training on the field right beside him. And asked his dad what happened. He said he had a stroke. He's got cerebral palsy. So it's very yeah. hard sometimes to to actually f to understand what it is. So we're trying to educate. In in a perfect world, we'd educate every coach in Canada, um, and then they they would return be our scouts for us type thing. Uh, so if you know if if John Herman wanted to go watch one of those players, he could fly anywhere in the world to see a person play, or watch it via video. I can't go see a guy playing because I don't know if he has if he has rebuild falls or not because nobody's contacted me right or or they know themselves. So we we've got to do a little bit better educating. It's it's hard as you know in this big country, um, but we just got to keep plugging away and, and figure it out. I mean we we've done fairly well and to be ranked where we are in the world right now under without all the opportunities that other countries may have uh you know in holland and scotland and they all they they have training camps every weekend because they all just get in their bike or their train and they and they're they're in their town right there and they train every single weekend right you know the english fa has lots of money they bring them in all the time the usa has lots of money they bring them in all the time so our resources aren't quite as good as theirs and our country is a lot bigger than theirs so it's uh it's a little hard, but education, education, yeah. education. Well, the good thing is I know a few people in that department, so <laughs> I'll be able to 
make some yes, inroads in that, that respect. Area. So, um, listen, I know you're busy. Thank you very much, Drew, for taking the time to join us and for raising the awareness about the Para program. Continued great success. Uh, most importantly, stay safe, stay healthy, stay well, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks for having me and uh, take care. Good chat with you. Awesome. Thanks, Fergie. Much appreciated. Uh, when we come back after the break, we will speak to someone who claims to have scored a, a hat trick at BC Place, although it is most definitely open for debate and discussion. We'll get into that after the break. Stay tuned. He is the voice of soccer in Canada, a two-time winner of the Canadian Screen Award for Best Play-By-Play Announcer. He has called the action for everything soccer related at TSN for many years, including the FIFA World Cup, UEFA European Championships, and MLS on TSN. He graduated from the University of Sheffield with an honours degree in journalism before moving to Canada in 2006. But unbeknownst to many, he is also a movie star. Uh, has famously scored a hat trick at BC Place, although the legitimacy of that hat trick is absolutely open for debate and discussion, and we're going to get into that in a second. Uh, But perhaps most importantly, he is a rising star in the grassroots coaching ranks of Markham Soccer Club. Uh, Very, very pleased to have my former partner in crime at TSN on the podcast joining us today, Mr. Luke Wildman. Luke, how are you today? I'm really good. I'm (laughs) first off... This is this is very unnerving having you asking me the questions because <laughs> in our relationship on air, I don't think that has ever been the case. It's always been the other way around. You you have no um, idea how this is going to go because you're not in control now. That's the thing, I, that, uh, and that's the problem, right? So, <laughs> so that's the first part. The second is uh, that was that was quite an interesting bio. Some of it, um, obviously, we'll get into is, is true, and some is a little bit stretched from the truth there. But we'll wait and see. The, 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 I'll be honest. When I wrote that, it was the hardest thing I had to write. Those are the nicest things I've ever said about you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't recognize myself at all, to be honest. No. With you. Apart from the hat trick, apart from the hat trick, because I know I've I've lived off that well, one for well, a while. Listen, let's start with that because that's obviously a bone of contention here. Because, like, how would you how would you traditionally define a hat trick in football? When you score three goals on the same pitch on the same day. You no, know, well, really, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that's the actual definition. Don't they have to happen in the same game? <laughs> but when the games are small, when it's like th- three small games, then that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, yeah. I think we can stretch it to to make that that fit. So <laughs> look, I, I haven't had many, I haven't had many on pitch successes in my career. I, I, you know, we can go all the way back to when I was playing for Pomona Panthers as an under 10 year old being club man of the year, that was probably about as good as it got until that day at BC place when, you know, I I often miss those days when we used to, we used to be able to go out to Vancouver a lot. And the the Whitecaps media game was one of the highlights of the year. And (laughs) for you, um, it was to, to be able to, to be able to perform at that level on a year when only me and Camilo scored hat tricks at BC Place is something that will live long in the memory. I can't believe Robbo didn't give you a contract after that. I really, I, I don't know what he was thinking. Well, there's a few times I could have maybe helped them out, but um, <laughs> yeah, you know, that that was the one day I rose from being. I've traditionally been that, you know, non-tackling right back with a long throw, but I think now. Um, you know, my, my attacking abilities have certainly come to the fore in, in recent years. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting. So the, the backstory to all of this, uh, for the, for the listeners who are going to be scratching their heads in confusion, wondering what all the inside jokes are, the Vancouver Whitecaps a few years ago had, had put on their, their first ever media game. And it, it was a great experience. It was a lot of fun. Everyone from the media really enjoyed it. And, uh, I don't know if it was in the first year or the second year, it might've been the second year that they had it, that you, you scored this alleged hat trick it wasn't the first year was it <laughs> um i i can't remember i, that I, far, I, I just I, I remember you won the tournament one year didn't you two actually back to back yeah but uh, let's not talk about right. that because that's not important but <laughs> what what what, it, what is important is that you scored one because obviously the me- members of the media were, were not the fittest we're certainly not professional athletes anymore uh, those of us who were lucky enough to play at that level but they, they had some small sided I think it was 7v7 or, or 9v9 but uh, the, the pitches were small it was half pitch uh, they broke it up into two fields and, and the, you know the games were I don't know 10 minutes long in length 15 minutes maybe max I can't remember but uh, there were several games played over a short you know couple hours uh, at, at BC Place and you scored one goal in three different games. And 
and in your mind that was a hat trick and and so <laughs> you 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 I, I the the other memory that sticks out to me from those media games and I still I have photo evidence of this you tried to top me like you proper tried to top me you went right over top of the ball and you tried to do me but I saw it coming a mile away cuz you, you know you you were a non tackling right back after all uh, and I managed to get out of the way but uh, I I couldn't believe that the the malice that you had in the, in your face when uh, when you, when you tried to, to to do me in that it's crazy uh, I I understand that the photographic evidence does not look great. <laughs> However, I think malice is a little bit of a strong word. I, I I was trying to maybe, you know, make a good tackle and I couldn't get there quick enough. I think that's probably what happened. <laughs> um, I was going with all the force I could possibly muster, thinking that this highlight could be on at halftime of the, the MLS on TSN game the day after because we were filming it for, for the halftime show. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then you read it all the way and made me look stupid. Yeah, it was something that we did. We we did a lot of. I think we tried to make each other look 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 foolish. So, um, you you mentioned something there that that really uh, brought back some memories to me. The Pomona Panthers. Uh, to talk a little bit about your your childhood, because you were you're you were born in Sheffield, drawn field, I believe it is near Sheffield. Yep. Um, uh, grew up, mom, dad, sister, lovely, lovely people, by the way, because I've met them. I always thought you 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 must have been adopted because you you, you know your your family was so nice and then and then there and then there was Luke. <laughs> yeah, no, I, th- I yeah, I did. I did grow up um in Dromfield, which is just over the Yorkshire border in Derbyshire. Yeah. Um but close enough to Sheffield, right in between Sheffield and Chesterfield. So I okay. could go and watch the Blades one week and then Chesterfield the next. Yeah. Um and it was just a you know, that's one of the things that I miss and hopefully we'll get to the point here in Canada is just that that football culture of um, 24-7, everywhere you go, everybody's talking about the game, everybody has the jerseys on. In Sheffield, you're either a United or a Wednesday fan. Yeah. Um, and you, you you cannot grow up without being immersed in the sport. And everyone then goes and plays for their teams. It's very important, obviously, that you, you get to, to play for a, a decent team as you're growing up. Um, I, I think decent is a little bit of a stretch in terms of the Pomona Panthers. Um <laughs> We were probably not, uh, you know, we weren't one of the highest level teams, but, you know, we were okay. We had fun and that's what it's about. And then I was, I was a bit of, uh, in England, you would call it an anorak. I don't know if people would know what that is here, but you, you would know. It's like the, you know, the <laughs> yeah. stats guy. The, yeah. I, I wasn't, I wasn't great at the soccer stuff. So I would make every week a match day program for our under 10 team or whatever, whatever age we were at. And I would have them photocopied and I would interview the coach for the coach's comments. And I would, and then I would go and sell them before the game for 10p each to all of the parents and we'd, we'd raise some money during the year um but yeah for that reason when they're giving out the awards at the end of the season it's like okay players player of the year managers player of the year and then and then they're like well this kid's put so much effort into making this program every week what can we do so he's never going to win even defender of the year or right back of the year <laughs> even though i was the only one so let's create this club man of the year award because he's done a lot for the club and he's made some money. And so, so anyway, I still have the award downstairs and we, it's in the basement here. Not, not on show, but i I did bring it across with me to that one. And my, um, my Welly Wanga, uh, trophy <laughs> that I got from St. Andrew's primary school, the day that the day that the Dutch in 88 had that goal, um, um, in the 88 euros, uh, the Van Basten Van goal. Van Basten, yes. Arno, yeah, the crossfield ball. Arno the Muir crossfield into Van ball. Basten. The, yeah, yeah. One yeah. of the best goals you're likely to see. I remember <laughs> coming home with my welly wanging trophy from the school sports day and watching that goal on the TV, and I thought this was the best day in the world. So yeah, they're, they're my two uh, two trophies to show for for my my youth in Sheffield. Yeah, the uh, the club man of the year. It's not even the most improved player, is it? It's 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 more of no, a. No, it's <laughs> there was a most improved player. Yeah, I wasn't that either. You didn't win that either. <laughs> but hey, listen, it started it started you off on on your love affair with football, and that's the that, that's the, the the big thing. And we we say this to coaches and 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 people in our coach education courses all the time that your your job is to let make kids fall in love with the game and and you know playing you know, as a non-tackling right back with a long throw in for the Pomona Panthers kickstarted it for you. And, and, and yeah, you mentioned a couple of things there too, uh, Sheffield United, you're either a Blades fan or a, or Wednesday fan, which side of the divide do you fall on? 
Um, well, of course, I worked for Radio Sheffield for the BBC for a long time, and so I had to be 100% neutral during those days. But I grew up as a Sheffield United fan, and I ha- since I finished working there, and I could probably never go back there now, having having put this out publicly, um, I, am a, I am a Sheffield United fan. Although, at that point in time, when I was probably 10, 11, 12 years old, even though the family were Blades fans, one week we'd go to watch Sheffield United and another week we'd go to watch Sheffield Wednesday, just so that on a Saturday afternoon, we had the chance to go and watch a live game. Um, and also my dad at that time used to do some scouting for Leeds United when Howard Wilkinson was the manager there in the in the mid-90s. So I'd get the chance to go. I'd, I'd often go and watch the Blades. Sometimes I'd go and watch Wednesday, but also he'd be doing going to a lot of the games around the Yorkshire clubs and, and some of the games in, in the Midlands as well, Forest. Derby County, Notts County. So, so I was immersed in this and, you know, Saturday, you, you know, as a player, Saturday is what you live for. Well, even when you're growing up and you're going to school every day, for me, that, that was, that was what you were looking forward to. Uh, it would be Monday morning and you're sitting in math class at 10 a.m. thinking about what game you were going to be able to go and see on Saturday or if it was a midweek game that you could go to yeah. or when your next game was that you were playing. Um, and that's what I mean by that way of life that, that, um, hope, hopefully with, with my kids that are here now, especially Hudson, who's the oldest one, he has that ingrained in him at the moment because he just sees football all the time. Um, and he, he's the same thing in terms of, you know, I recognize myself with him when he's like making posters for games and stuff and putting scarves up around the wall and things like that. I used to do all those kinds of things and you can, it's such a different way of growing up now, but you can still have that way that you are immersed in the game, whether it's he watches YouTube videos um, of people, of tours of stadiums, of of freestylers like the F2 doing their videos and things like that, and then goes out in the garden and, and tries it. Um, and it's 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 great to see him having that, that dis- love for the game that I had when I was growing up and to be able to recognize that, you know, and, and see a bit of yourself um, and that enthusiasm for football that uh, that he has now that I had back then. Yeah, but he, he has ability, though. That's the difference, isn't it? <laughs> I've taught him everything he knows. <laughs> wait, wait, so. yeah. what, what, what did you do after 30 minutes then? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I... I you know what he he does he's probably better than i was but um it, it's just the whole it's just the whole like i'm sitting actually in his room now and i look around because it was the quietest place that there is in the house so yeah. i came back i came in here and told him he's not allowed in for an hour <laughs> and the wall i i can see he's got sergio aguero up harry kane he's got mesut ozil he's got the premier league fixture list he's got Everton, Blades, Real Madrid scarves up on TFC, yeah. uh, Mississauga Metro stars up on the wall. Like, and it's just, it reminds me so much of, of that. And I think that's the sort of thing that hopefully as this game continues to grow in our country, that more and more kids are going to be able to have those posters and things up on the wall. He's got some Jays and some, some Leafs and Raptors as well, but it's like, there's no doubt football's first and everything else is second. And, yeah. and I see that more and more. I see that more and more in, in the kids that he knows and the kids that he sees at school and, that, and at soccer and that sort of thing. So um, it, it's, uh, it, it's a real good thing to see. I, th- I think one of the important pieces here, and, and uh, I'll use Hudson as, as a, an example, because, you know, you've told me all about his love affair with those other sports as well. And there were periods of his life, I mean, talking like he's an old man, he's still a child, but <laughs> <laughs> there were periods of his life where he was enamored by the Jays or enamored by the Raptors and he, or he wanted to play baseball. Baseball was the most important thing. But what I love about you know what you're saying is that this is him driving the bus on what he loves, not not you. You're not the the parent that's pushing him to be a professional footballer and dragging him out to the to the pitch to to train. It's the other way around because he just loves to play sport. Yeah, and you know what? Two or three years ago, uh, when we would go out vacation to the West and go and watch the Mariners play baseball, or we'd go down to the Sky Dome and and see the Jays play on a number of occasions. I was, he loved the base, he loved the game and he was playing it as well as soccer. And I was almost pushing baseball a little bit more because for me, that was like, that was my, that was my way out of work. That was sort of my, that was my relaxation, if you like, going yeah. to watch the baseball and you can Have switch off and you're not, yeah. ex- <laughs> not a hot dog. That's <laughs> not right. pay attention. Hot yeah. dog or a burger. Um, but no, that was, that was more, so for me, it was more of a relaxing way of just going to watch your kid play. Whereas in soccer, it's almost as if it's very difficult to, to, um, 
not connect yourself with work and with what you're thinking about in terms of how you would call a game, even when yeah. you're watching a soccer game just for for for, for fun. Um, every time you're thinking about your experiences and what you've gone through and all that sort of thing. So the baseball I really enjoyed, um, but yeah, he he. Um, he found his way towards soccer being the main thing, and um, it, it certainly is now, absolutely. But uh, yeah, the, the other sports as well um, is is so big in terms of um, just being able to enjoy. Like we would have we would have emails during the homeschooling, which was a completely different uh, homes. Right. <laughs> I was I was going to um, ask about that. I'm going to save that for later. <laughs> yeah, you know, patience isn't my uh, strongest no uh, suit. Um, <laughs> But we would have emails from the the phys ed teachers at school saying, um, "Can you can you do twenty minutes or thirty minutes of exercise a day, or do you, do you do this, or do you do do you get out the, outside and do this or whatever?" And and he's been outside two three hours a day, even in March and April when it was cold, doing various different sports or riding his bike or, or running or whatever it is. Um, so it doesn't, to me, it's great that it is soccer, but it didn't have to be soccer. It could have been anything that just keeps him active and keeps him interested in sports and, and building that side of his development. So mm. um, yeah, it, it's the, the baseball is one thing um, really any kind of sport he, he will sit on and, and watch for hours on TV. So it's better than when we used to have to watch all those TV, you know, treehouse TV shows like Peppa pig and you know <laughs> caillou and all of those things that uh <laughs> oh that's brilliant i i uh there's so many questions i could ask right now that uh, i'm gonna let them i'm gonna let them slide because i know where they'll end up um I, I know your love affair of children's television knows no bounds um you mentioned something interesting there though just about his his bedroom and and having the you know the pictures plastered everywhere we, we just had drew ferguson on uh our head coach of our our uh, para team and uh, he was talking about when he was a you know a youngster growing up having shoot magazine match magazine and getting them sent over from the UK and whatnot and and just having that exposure and and we we've talked about this a lot in our broadcasting days about just how important it is for kids in Canada to have access to football and you know when I was a kid and a dating myself a little bit there wasn't a lot of football on television there was soccer Saturday with Graham Leggett and uh, and our uh, our wonderful friend Vic Router, but there yep. there wasn't a lot of football to watch on TV. Now you can watch more football live in Canada than you can if you lived in the UK. And and do you think that that has an impact on your children and and their love affair with football? Yeah, it does. And I, I also think that obviously success of teams does. And when we were talking about the baseball. It was almost like that run the Blue Jays had a couple of years ago where they were getting to the playoff fine, um, to, deep into the playoffs and getting to the American Series Championship and all that. Um, that really fueled a fire in him. But then came TFC, 2016 to MLS Cup. 2017, they win it. They're in the Champions League as well. And I think having that, having the team, you know, one of your local teams to be able, be able to hang on to and actually see that is is so huge. Um, and even moving forward now with the Canadian Premier League coming in, um, there's nothing better last year, we haven't been able to do it this year, than than either being able to go with him to watch York 9 or to, I, I don't get the chance obviously with TFC because I'm doing the games, but we went to a lot of home games at York 9 and just to be able to sit with him and watch the game, watch the live pro game. Yeah you know, 20, 25 minutes away from home and yeah, go get your hot dog and whatever, but enjoy the experience. Um, and then his team w went once, um, actually it was the first ever home game York 9 played against Blainville in the Canadian Championship. And his team um, uh, at U8s at the time from Markham were able to lead the team out. So he led out the team with Manny Aparicio and all of his teammates were behind him. Yeah, um, And it's that, it's that touch point and that experience that I think more and more now, yes, it's great that you can watch wall-to-wall -wall soccer on TV. But I think having that connection locally is the next step. And that's why it's been so great with TFC Montreal and Vancouver. And now we can get even closer to people with the, the CPL teams um, going coast to coast and hopefully more and more of those to come. Just giving kids that opportunity to to go and, you know, 
he 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 stood and waited 15 minutes after the game at York Nine to get Ryan Telfer's autograph. Yeah. It, it's it's just that that sort of connection that you need to build, um, and I, I I see the start of that now with with MLS and now with CPL and just being able to get close to these players and to to start to have more of a relationship with a club that is right there that you can participate in rather than just watching on the television. I think is is another step forward. Yeah, it's such a huge piece. I've said this repeatedly in other uh, podcasts and interviews that having uh, an, an opportunity to see professional football live in person and to know that one day you may have the opportunity as a 10, 12, 14, 16 year old, that that you may have the opportunity a little later on in your, your development pathway that that might be a realistic opportunity for you. I was really fortunate in the sense that the Canadian Soccer League existed in the, the the short period of time that it did. And I just happened to be coming into those years, 16, 17, 18, because if I didn't have that opportunity to play in that league, I never would have had the ability to go and, and, and make the jump to Europe and play there and play for the national team. So my entire playing career would have been lost if I didn't have that opportunity. And I think that's the huge benefit of having more and more pro clubs um, as, as options. On the women's side, it would be fantastic if we had the exact same type of an opportunity. And I know that there are discussions about bringing women's professional football to Canada in one form or another. Um, you came to Canada in 2006 and you kind of went in at the ground level with TFC who started in 2007. Talk a little bit about that period of your life, your career. How, how did you end up going to TFC to work there? Um, and, and how did you start working in, in Canada? Well, I, I originally came across, I was working at the BBC and they had a, they had a program where you could have a one year sabbatical and they would hold your job, um, for the year. Um, and I was working, I'd done some work with Radio 5, which is the national sports station there. And also in Leeds and Sheffield as well as the sports editor. Um, so, I was happy doing all that stuff, but then ended up getting married to a Canadian who, um, you know, her family thought that it was the best thing to do, obviously, to move to Canada. And I wasn't against it at the time. I thought it was a great, uh, great chance to be able to come and move to a new country. So I did at the time and um, had nothing lined up, but it, it all fell into place for me in that 2000, it was Christmas 2006. And in the summer of 2007, it was going to be the first year of TFC. And it was going to be the FIFA under 20 World Cup uh, as well played in Canada. Um, so I was able to pick up some some work early with uh, with the Fan 590 and, and with uh, Canadian Press as well, um, writing some reports about TFC and about the the Canadian, uh, the FIFA under 20 World Cup games um, and, and doing some TFC reports throughout that first season for the Fan 590. They were really good with me when I arrived. Um, so I was able to get a foot in the door that way and I, I got to know a lot of people at TFC and fortunately for me, a, a permanent job came up with the club just at the end of that first season, um, which at the time was doing um, basically online marketing and, and looking after the club website and doing a little bit of media stuff as well. Um, but then, of course, they went and, and got Goal TV. So I was positioned perfectly to be able to, to get back into the commentary side of things and, and to start doing some TV work there, which is where we first started working together back in... <laughs> Oh nine, two thousand. Oh, yeah, in, would have been it, it in the train. Oh nine, in, in the train <laughs> cabinet uh, thing in, in Kansas in, City. In, in the box car. Yeah, the, the, that's uh, what. Yeah, the, 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 the Wizards. <laughs> yeah, that was that was our. I think that was the first game that we called together. Was the TFC was. game at, at, at KC in uh, in the baseball it was community. It, it, it was at the America ballpark. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was. And and they literally plunked a boxcar on the side of a hill. And it wasn't even a, a large hill. So it's not like we were looking over the field um, on the side of a hill beside the pitch and cut a hole in it and said, OK, <laughs> this is the broadcast booth. Uh, and, and I remember you and I looked at each other and we're just like, what are we doing? <laughs> this is broadcasting. We had no idea. But uh, yeah. I, I do. I think Jimmy Brennan scored a goal that day. Did he not? He did. Yeah, I think they won 3-2. Yeah, I think yeah. they won 3-2 and he either scored one or two goals on that day, including one really nice left foot shot that he'd uh, run onto near the edge of the box, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah, it was. And um, that was, 
Yeah, that was a rude introduction in terms of uh, <laughs> of broadcasting in Major League Soccer. Although having said that, I mean, you look at their their place now where they are sporting Kansas City, an incredible state of the art stadium. And yeah. even when you think over the last, it still for me it still seems like I just moved here, even though it was almost fifteen years ago now. Um, but to see the development in the stadiums that we've got, not just here, but also in the U.S. as well, and the way that the way that the league has grown in terms of Major League Soccer since then with the new teams coming in and the, the standard of play um, has been incredible. It really has. Yeah, it, um, it's evolved, I think is a great way to put it. And, uh, you know, you look at just the stadiums alone. It, you know, I haven't had the pleasure myself of going down there. I'm sure you have. I know you have. But, uh, you know, you look at Atlanta and the environment yeah. down there. Uh, remarkable. Uh, even even BMO Field, Toronto FC, the experience there. Um, we, we, we called a lot of... Uh, Tough games <laughs> over the years. I wondered uh, what you, I wondered which word you were going to use. Yeah, well, it wasn't it wasn't easy. Uh, it wasn't easy at times. But if you if you look at the 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 game experience, uh, you know the the atmosphere, the passion, and we saw this with the women's World Cup in in 2015 as we went round the country. You see the look on the kids' faces and it's like they're hooked. You know, you're living it right now with your children, with Hudson. Um, they're hooked. It's it's the experience. It's the atmosphere. It's the first time my dad takes me to the game or my mom takes me to the game and I get to see it and feel it and touch it and live it and breathe it. It's like a drug. You're hooked on it for life. And, and, and that is so important. And, you know, what I'm really excited about is what impact is this going to have? MLS, CPL, uh, professional football in our country. What impact is that going to have on the next generation of kids? Um, how much has it changed over that period of time? Just, just the last 10, 11 years in your mind? Well, I think one of the big things is that more and more people care about it. And that's that's with each year that goes by. I think we see that the the net is widening in terms of how many people are showing much more of an invested interest in the game and in these teams that we've got throughout the country now, um, and that's huge. And and you, you cannot understate what these signature moments have done as well. We talk about the two thousand seven under twenty World Cup. Um, and the fact that even at that point in time, TFC were just coming in. And obviously it was the first year there. They got the boost with David Beckham coming into the league as well. But even moving forward and, you know, some of the some of the moments that I've had the chance to be involved with over the last over a decade now, um, having worked, have worked here or been here since 2006 and worked at TSN since 2011, there was that there was that. 2012 Olympic bronze medal that we had the opportunity to call uh, the games yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> um, th that were played in London. And uh, even now that that game, you know, even though they lost it, I think the game at Old Trafford has done as much for the game, for, for growing soccer in this country of people of a certain age at that moment in time mm -hmm. than even just going on to win the, win the bronze medal. Because at that moment in time on that day, everybody across this country was watching that team and felt the injustice and felt that connection. And it lit a fire in a lot of people. And even now, when you talk to some of the, the, the players that are coming through, um, even some of the players that, you know, it made me feel really old when I was doing some of my research for the, the World Cup the last time <laughs> around. And they're all talking about, oh, well, you know, that lit a spark under me in 2012. And I really wanted to get to the next level with Canada and all that. And I'm thinking, how, are, how old am I right now? Um, <laughs> But but I think that was a pivotal moment. And then you mentioned 2015, which was one of the most incredible months that we're ever likely to experience. And we had the privilege of traveling across the country, seeing these full stadiums. Um, and obviously, we've got 2026 coming as well. And I think these are the key moments that we can use as stepping stones to build on moving forward. With everything else that is happening as well, those moments just give you that that intensity in terms of the the connection that people can have with their teams, even TFC winning in, in 2017. I mean, I have to thank you for, for leaving the broadcast booth, of course, because it had been nothing but abject failure in terms of Canada's MLS teams up until that point. All it took then, was me leaving. That's all it took. Uh, 
it was it was sept- was it September of 2016? <laughs> it was. It yes, was. Yeah, yeah. And then they got TFC made it into the the playoffs that year, and and obviously they lost in the final. Then the year after there was the the incredible series with Montreal. They got to the final again, the Concacaf Champions League. Yeah. It's been nothing but it's been nothing but success since you walked out I know, of the booth. I know. The, I, well, you you remember you remember September 2016 because you've got it circled in your calendar as an anniversary date, and you have a party every time that rolls around. I'm sure you. I'm sure you were happy to see the back of me. What I remember about September 2016 is you just, you'd been away to the Olympics, hadn't you, with, with Canada? Yes, yes. And you, you came yes. back and you were just, you'd got half your foot, at, in fact, one leg completely out of the door and you were almost gone to your new job. And they're like, we need someone to go to Columbus and do the Columbus crew <laughs> against the Whitecaps. And you thought you were home and dry, uh, right? And then we're, I, I, we're, <laughs> we're sitting in the booth at Maffray Stadium in a huge storm with a lightning delay. And it's like, you, just when you thought you'd, you'd managed to, to get out, you were pulled back in again. And that night in Columbus, that was the end of it all. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was wondering if you were going to bring that up because what I remember about that trip was not so much the rain delay. I, I remember that they were right in the heart of the presidential election. Oh, yes. So, Donald Trump was running for president. And do you remember the the camera operator yes. and the floor manager and the sound technician? So who, who could forget? So so, <laughs> so we 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 had we had uh, we had a split in the in the in the record in this in the broadcast booth. The booth there at Mapfree Stadium is quite small. There's not a lot of room there. So we we actually had three people. Normally we are lucky if we have one, uh, just a camera operator, but we had a, a camera operator, we had a sound technician, and we had a floor manager. So the camera operator was a retired uh, U.S. Uh, I think he was Army, might yeah. have been yeah. uh, Luke. I can't remember. Um, older gentleman, Republican, staunch Republican. You know, if we had seen his car in the parking lot, I'm certain <laughs> it would have it would have it would have had uh, you know Trump for president on on, on the bumper sticker. Yeah. Uh, then the other two, uh, the sound technician and the uh, the floor manager, were much younger Democrats and. Luke doesn't like controversy. Luke shies away <laughs> from any kind of confrontation. I mean, so what I thought what might be fun to do is to kind of just start asking them questions about the upcoming election to, to you know, being uh, being from Canada and, and not having a, a great, uh, you know, understanding of U.S. politics, although I, I certainly do follow it a lot more closely than I let <laughs> on to them. You the flames. Just- <laughs> you stoked the flames to the point where I was willing to go and stand in the storm outside and chance being hit by lightning because I just <laughs> didn't. Yeah. I was hiding behind the we- back of the door. I thought they were going to come to blows. We, we, uh, well, when I say we, I very nearly started a fist fight amongst the <laughs> Republicans and the Democrats in, in the in, in the broadcast booth in Columbus, um, because I was just asking questions about this upcoming election. And uh, it really, really highlighted though, Luke, the, the polarizing political views in that country. It came to life in front of us. And the other thing is you, you <laughs> knew at that point, you never had to go back there again in that broadcast booth. And of course- <laughs> Some of us still had to go there following years. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was fascinating. Uh, there's there's a thousand stories that I want to touch on that we could talk about our our time over the years, but I, I wanted to give the listeners an opportunity to kind of get a a sense of the preparation that you go into, and and uh, I'll say this with a with a straight face and, and be serious. You you are the best in the business. I mean, you you're you know awards aside, you know working with you was was a real pleasure pleasure and a privilege because I learned so much about the process of broadcasting aside from the fact that you you use stickers and and uh, <laughs> you, you know you go. used to used to use pen and paper for everything T- tell tell the listeners a little bit about the preparation that goes into a broadcast what do you do in the lead up to a game are you still using stickers and <laughs> and if so why <laughs> and 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 what is that like for you because everyone hears the 90 minute call and it just sounds so slow slick and so fluid, but there's actually a lot of work that goes into that in preparation. The, the, the stickers have gone, you'll be pleased to know, but, but <laughs> they haven't been replaced by an iPad or a laptop or anything like that. They've, I've just gone back purely to pen and paper. So I, I always find it much easier to have things written down in front of me. And someone once said to me as I was uh, 
um, talking with another broadcaster, a guy who works for Univision called Jorge Perez Navarro. He said to me once, if you don't write it down, you won't remember it. And once you get into that 90 minute game, you know, when you've got the, the producer talking in one ear and um, you're listening to what the other person in the booth saying and you're watching the game and things can things can so easily disappear from your mind. So that's why I write it down, because then I've I've looked it up. I've researched it. I've written it down. Then I can read it again <laughs> before the game starts. So, yeah, but the stickers, I mean, you used to make fun of me all the time because the stickers would cause me problems sometime when there was a change in formation and they made, <laughs> if I if I was oh. still doing stickers now in the days of five substitutes at the same time, I, yeah. I don't know what, what mess I would have been in. But, um, so, so what, <laughs> what Luke used to do is he used to take the, you know, the A4 sheet of, of, uh, labeling stickers and he used to write out, you know, every player's name and number and key statistics and everything. And so he'd have this sheet, one for each team where, where all the players in, in the roster are, are lined up. And then when we got the lineup, he would take his, his, uh, yellow manila envelope and open it up. <laughs> so he's got both sides and then he would put one team in the formation that they're in and in, uh, on one side and the other other team in the formation and use the stickers to put the players in the right position. And the funniest thing w- would happen. And it was almost on an every game, wasn't it? That, that there would be there a would substitution be a moment, yeah. made, there would be a substitution made, or there would be a change in formation and Luke would have to rearrange his stickers. And, I, and there's still one game that stands out. The picture on your face was brilliant. You had about four different players on your fingers because you had the stickers off ready to go. Cause the, the, the coach kept making a, 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 a change of mind. So at first it was one player going on. Then that person sat down. Then the next person got up and then he sat down and the next person. So you're standing there and just getting red in the face and furious because you just want to put your darn sticker on your manila paper. (laughs) Meanwhile, I'm sitting next to you with an iPad, literally dragging and dropping names and statistics into my little, uh, you know, uh, folder that I use. And and I just, it was, it was a clash of, of, uh, of, uh, of systems and personalities. What I used to always tell people is the old Apple commercial, Luke was the PC, and I was the Apple guy. So I was using all the technology and Luke was still pen and paper, but uh, yeah, it, stickers. <laughs> it, it was it was probably Aaron Vinter who was the coach, That just to have a, have a guess at that one. Um, but yeah, I, I've always, and it goes back to that, that, what we talked about, about when I was growing up and loving the stats and the facts and the figures and all that sort of thing. Um, I almost enjoyed preparing for the game as much as actually calling it itself and, and just going and finding. I'll usually spend, for each, for each game I do, I'll spend a full day or you know with kids around it tends to be two half days or whatever it is that you can you can do um going into the research about both of the teams and both of the players and and then we'll get the chance to go to training the day before the game or talk to the coaches on the phone if it's uh if it's a road game or we don't have that opportunity to talk to them um and it's just that you feel it's almost like going into an exam. Sometimes you're not going to need the information. In fact, if it's a really good game, most of the time you won't need a lot of the work you've done. But you just feel comfortable when you sit in that chair ready to call the game when the yeah. first whistle goes. You need to we could we could have turned up and done a game maybe maybe on the odd occasion we did without very much prep because <laughs> just of what the schedule was like or whatever happened, what, yeah. whatever was going on. Yeah. But you didn't feel as good. It didn't feel right. And I suppose that's the same as when you were a player. If you were, I know at the end, you just turned up on a match day and you didn't bother training during the week and that sort of thing, but didn't need when to you're, just, just, just perform Luke. That's all you got to do is perform exactly. on a Saturday, <laughs> but it just, fe- it feels different if you haven't done the work beforehand, just like if you're going into the exam at school and you're not ready and you haven't revised and you'll probably get some questions right, but you won't do it as well. And you you won't feel as comfortable. So even if I don't use 80% of what I've got written on those stickers or in those books, it still, I think, adds helps me with the broadcast because I've just got that confidence going in that whatever happens in this game, whoever comes off the bench, whoever scores the goal, whatever stories there are, I'm not going to be caught out by one of them. And I think that that helps you to to call the game in in a better rhythm, knowing that you're confident and comfortable with with having done your prep for the game. Yeah. The, the analogy that I always use, it was just like being a player. If you train well during the week, you'll go into a match on a Saturday and you'll just know that you're ready. 
And then there will be other times, and, and sometimes it'll be through no fault of your own. Maybe you'll pick up a knock and you can't train, or maybe you, you know, you're, you're, you're ill or you're, you, you're, you're under the weather or whatever, and you're not able to have a, a full solid week of training. You'll, you'll, you'll show up on the Saturday and you'll play, but there will always be in the back of your mind, this little tinge of doubt about whether I'm ready or not. And, and what I've always felt was when, when the red light goes on, when you've done the work and the camera's on, you've got to have the information right there at the tip of your tip of your tongue. And I always found working with you that you always had that. It was, there was never a moment where I felt that you were flustered or didn't have the right words or the right phrase or the right statistics, unless it was not being handed to you by the stats guy beside you, who was maybe giving you the wrong information. (laughs) And that was putting, putting you into a bit of a spin. (laughs) Or, or, uh, Um, or on a game day when you, you can't leave the hotel at exactly the time that you want to, because someone's lost, uh, (laughs) lost the car in a parking lot, which in Philadelphia, which, which wasn't you, but we don't need to, (laughs) Um, oh, that no, but, was brilliant. But, but, that was brilliant. But you're right in terms of the preparation, although although sometimes um, no, no one would... You just hope that at the end of the broadcast, even if it has gone a little bit wrong underneath the surface, people don't notice when they're watching. Yeah. And, and we remember in 2015, we had the opportunity to chat with John Roder, who's a BBC commentator. He was in Vancouver a lot for the games there during the yeah. World Cup. He actually he called, was fantastic. He called the World Cup final and he said something that's stuck with me forever. He said, commentating is like being a swan. He's like, what people see is the swan swimming nicely on top of the ocean or wherever it is and just gracefully you know, going through. And then underneath they're kicking their feet as fast as they possibly can to make sure that everyone <laughs> sees the thing on top, right? And, and sometimes yeah. that was what broadcasting's like, just, just doing what you need to to survive and make sure that no one notices what's going on behind the scenes uh, when it goes out on TV. So what about famous goal calls? Um You know, the one that sticks out for me, and we actually use it, the intro of the podcast, which is Matheson, is that the goal that wins bronze for Canada? Is is that something that you think about beforehand, or is that something that you just, you're inspired by the moment? Often I would say the moment. That that one, I hadn't really got anything, I hadn't got anything lined up. Sometimes I'll get some ideas thinking going in. in, in fact, um, I remember sitting at TSN the morning of MLS Cup in 2017, and I said to KJ, who was on the Premier League show that day, uh, or was it 2016? I'm not sure. It was either the one, one, of the, one of the two. And I said, I don't know what I'm going to say if they win this tonight or if they score a goal. And we just sat and brainstormed for a few minutes with a few lines or so, <laughs> a few different things that I could maybe use. And, and it's just, um, you know, there are a few that I've just, just signature moments that I feel you know, you have to get it right for that moment because it's going to live on. And that's one of them. Another one is the the Whitecaps' first ever goal in MLS when Eric Hasley scored that goal. They're only going to score one first ever goal in Major League Soccer. So that was a great moment. Yeah. Um, the Altador yeah. goal, TFC, MLS Cup. Um, you know, there are, there are a few. Um, even, even some that haven't been sort of huge moments, but like the, the Christine Sinclair... I say huge moment. It was a it was a huge moment at the time. The Christine Sinclair penalty in that first game, right at the death of the the opener China. in Commonwealth Stadium. Yeah. I mean, that not only and and still to this day, it, it gives me goosebumps to see that picture where they're all running towards John Herdman and the rest of the team by the dugout there. Um, yeah. Remember how good that felt inside Commonwealth Stadium that day with a with a full house and Canada welcoming the world in. And just that moment there, because in the end, Canada just got through as the group winner. And that 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 penalty by Christine Sinclair could have had sent things so much in a different direction for that World Cup. And even though Canada yeah. didn't go on and win it to be able to get through to the quarterfinals and have the moments that we did along the way and then finish in Vancouver with those games against Switzerland and England as well. Um, you know, the, it, it was a fantastic time to be able to, and privilege to be able to call those games. But that Sinclair moment with everything on her shoulders at that moment in time um, at Commonwealth Stadium, that was, that was incredible to see, to see such a, such a professional be able to carry it out for her country with everyone holding its breath um, see that happen was was fantastic. Yeah, greatest of all time. And full stop. It's uh, men's or women's football. Greatest goal scorer in the history of the game, and she's Canadian. It's it's uh, it's incredible. 
you, you've had a lot of memorable goal calls. You, you've also said a lot of memorable things off air. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I started writing them down. No, you don't still um, have it, many, surely. Many years ago. I do. I do. I still have this. So when, when we worked together, I started uh, on my iPhone just taking a note. Taking a note. And I came up with a title. I won't say what it is. I'll, I'll paraphrase. <laughs> Stuff, Luke says, is, is what I, I entitled it. But, but by the way, at this, at this point in time, when we were, we were traveling, there were two or three years there where we did pretty much every Vancouver home game. And I would, yeah. see, I would yeah. have more meals with you in the course of a year than I actually would yeah. with my wife. I know. I can actually order in any restaurant for you because I know what you eat. <laughs> I know I know exactly what you're going to have. Um, but you said so many things that, that to this day, it still makes me laugh. I burst out laughing when I read this. So I, I still have this note. This might come out someday in the future. I'm not going to say anything uh, on air now because some of it is maybe not suitable for for the podcast. But uh, I still laugh and 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 that it's a, it's a huge piece of of the uh, the broadcast experience though, is having a relationship. How, how much of, uh, how much of the, the, the success of a good broadcast comes from the relationship that you have with your on-air partners, your, your co-host, your, your, uh, your color commentary, your sideline reporter. Um, but also talk a little bit about the relationship with the coaches, because, people might not know this um in in north america it's important to build relationships with the coaches to get insight into how they're doing things how they want to do things some coaches are like open books others will give you nothing they don't even want to talk to you but how how important is that do you think for the the success of a broadcast to have some insight from the from both coaches as to how they're trying to go about winning this game. Yeah, that that's important and it gives you it gives you the opportunity to inform the listeners um more tactically about what is going on and how each coach is approaching the game and I think it also helps for the coaches. Um it happens in England and there's been a lot of them who have as I've worked over there they get in touch with you when they want something or when they think you can help them. Um, but here it's important to have that relationship on on an ongoing basis. And I think it benefits both parties. And you're right, some are better than others. Some are just genuinely nice guys um, and they enjoy talking about the game and, and they trust you. And they once you've got that trust, they're happy to tell you things which can help inform the broadcast. And even some things w- when you might not necessarily repeat it on air, but it will give you information or you as an analyst when you were doing the games, information information um, about a player's background that, that you might use to to inform your decision. Um, you know, and when a, when a change is made after 60 minutes and, and or, or the, the starting lineup comes out and you wonder why a certain player is playing in a different position, you don't have to just speculate or say, well, this is a very strange decision. I don't know what the coach is doing here uh, because you can actually get in front of it and and tell them why the coach is doing this and what the coach is thinking about. So that, that's big. And the other thing is, like you said, in terms of the relationship, um, for me, I've been lucky, even when I was back home in, in England, I would, I would host a one-hour show every night on Radio Sheffield where people would call in and talk sports. And it was me and two of my uh, colleagues who we became best friends during the time we were working. And it's basically just you're going on, TV or radio with your friends to talk about football. Um, And that's something that people would do down the pub in England every night. It's a privilege to be able to get paid to do it. Um, And, but, but, but for it to be good radio or TV, it helps that you have that relationship. It helps you from a technical perspective in that if, if, if you don't know what you're doing, someone's going to jump in and help you out and you know that you're on the same wavelength. Uh, but also yeah. just, just from that camaraderie of being able to entertain uh, and, and talk about the game um, and, and, you know, have jokes with people and argue with them if you want, but you know it's not really serious. You're just, you're just joking. Um, and, and you can only do that if those friendships are genuine off off air as, as they are on it. When, uh, when you worked in the UK and you did your post game radio call in show, did you ever have a manager call in? (laughs) Um, I had a manager, as, as you know, there is a famous manager who is, who just went back after his 17th retirement and is now uh, working at the age of 93 as the Middlesbrough manager, Neil Warnock, who would on his way home, on his way home, the show was called Praise or Grumble, which is it's quite a famous show in the Sheffield on the South Yorkshire area. Um, but he would you, drive. You were the grumble part, weren't you? I was. The, yeah, I was always the grumble. He would drive home <laughs> listening to the callers and texting me 
um, while the show would go on. And if I said anything that he didn't like, he would certainly uh, let me know. Um, and if it was an away game, he'd get his he'd get his wife Sharon to tape it and listen to it, <laughs> and note down all the points of the broadcast that he had to go back and listen to, just so that the following Monday he could tell me what he thought of it and why I was wrong, um, and why all these callers were wrong. So yeah, he was. You know what? I actually like I I I, I root for Neil Warnock. I like him. Um, he's a great character. The game needs characters, and you know what? I it was never dull. And there are some managers you would go and interview. <laughs> And it would just be like three minutes of pulling teeth and they wouldn't give you anything. Yeah. And, you know, it was just yeah. like, like I, I would imagine like when you were a player, when you were on your best behavior and you you were just giving this, the standard answers, you know, well, one game at a time, all that sort of, you didn't want to get into any, <laughs> yep. any trouble. Yep. Um, but yep. at least with Neil and a lot of other people, even with Chris Wilder now, who's the manager of the Blades now, you know, genuine characters who love the game, who are going to tell you what they think, whether it's right or wrong or whether they agree with you or not. Um, and I think that's good for the game, and I like those characters. And um, even though we had some run-ins at times, um, I still look for his <laughs> results, and I'm happy. You know, I'm happy Middlesbrough stayed up, and uh, for him and the team that he's got around him there. Yeah, it's uh, you're right. It, the game does need characters, and uh, you know, we we who are involved in the game at a professional level often think of it as life and death. But at the end of the day, it is also entertainment for people, and and it has to be entertaining. And and the you know the the page sixty three of the of the interview responses manual as isn't going to cut it most times and, and uh, you, you know you've you've been you've been fortunate to work with a lot of really good uh, managers who will give you good value. I, I said in the intro, uh, uh, you know, when I was talking so nicely about you, uh, that you're also a movie star and you, you tried very hard to keep this from us, but we we found out. I don't know how it came out. It slipped sometime in twenty fifteen, maybe twenty sixteen, but um, you, you were in a movie and you're actually you have a credit in imdb so if 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 you're interested you should you should look for monkey in the middle it was uh, recorded and filmed and shot in 2014 and and uh, tell us a little bit about your movie career in monkey in the middle oh yeah uh, <laughs> i don't know how they got my phone number but i just answered the phone one day while i was stringing the christmas lights up outside um, and someone said, uh, I'm calling from wherever it was and we're making a movie and we need someone to be a sports commentator. Would you like to do it? And my first thought was absolutely not. And then, um, <laughs> then I thought, well, you know, it's the off season, it's close by, why not give it a go? And yeah, it was a movie with a monkey. I didn't, the, the only disappointment for me was that I didn't actually shoot on the same day as the monkey. So I never, never got to meet the monkey. Um, but yeah, that was, that was my, my second sort of movie experience, my first one, um, I don't even know if you know, but back in back in when I was 14 years old, there was a movie that came out called Braveheart. And I actually, <laughs> and no, no, I, Sean Connery was in Braveheart. And, and my school, I did drama class at that time. And they put me forward from an audition to be, a, I think it was a young Sean Connery in the, like uh, the, the kid before he be moved on in, in Bra So I actually uh, once went for an audition for Bray. I didn't get it in the end. Otherwise it, it could have been a completely different <laughs> life for me. I could have been all Hollywood and, you know, but. It, so it, I, I have, I, I have that information because on February 21st, 2015, <laughs> I have in my note, in my notes on his acting career, I auditioned at 13 to play. Who was it again? Oh yeah, Sean Connery. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Those, those were the words that came out of your mouth. So I uh, I was aware of that. So yeah, I, I know. And you know, if it hadn't been for Momo the monkey, you, maybe you know you, you could have had a movie career and, and been off in Hollywood and, and living the dream. Who I'm knows? not writing it off, right? There's still an opportunity. You, you never know what happens here with uh, with life. You know, it could happen. You never know. Um, last thing I want to talk to you about, probably the most important thing I want to talk to you about is uh, you've fallen in love with coaching and, and it, I think it's fantastic. It's wonderful that you're, uh, you're engaged in the, the grassroots coaching experience, but you've been taking coach education courses through Ontario soccer at your, uh, your club, Markham soccer club, where your son plays. Talk a little bit about that experience. Why, what was it about coaching that you, that you fell in love with? Why do you enjoy it so much? Well, for, for a start, it's one of those things that I never expected that I would get into. And Oh, I, I, I didn't expect you to get into it either. 
Um, you're, you're, you're not what you're not what I would call a people person. <laughs> well, I've been as as a lot of people have said, I've been practicing for social distancing for many many years. So the last few months has has actually worked pretty it's well. No, it's been nor, normal life yeah, for you, exactly. basically. Um, yeah. So you know, back in he it would have been the start of the rep program, which was U7. We went for the tryouts and um, there's 40 kids all out there and someone from the club came over and they were talking to the person next to me. And, and then they're like, I, I recognize you. Um, are you, you're the guy off the television. I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Like, we need an assistant coach for this team. Do you, do you want to be involved? And I'm, I'm like, not really, but um, <laughs> I'm like, well, at least, at least if I say yes, my son's going to be on the team. Like, you know, you're not going to keep me and cut him. So, you know, anyway, I thought I would say yes. Um, and then, and then see how it went. And the, the problem is once you say yes, there's no way out. Right. So once you say yes, and you've got that free t-shirt, that's it. You're in, you're committed. You're, you're cornered. You're right? cornered. That, you're, you're cornered. So that's how it started. But having said that, from the from I wouldn't say from the first time, but from very early on when I got out onto the pitch with the kids, um, it's just something that I didn't think I would enjoy that now I absolutely love doing, and and yeah. and being able to like last night we trained at six and and I'm there at quarter to five. Even now is a bit more work, obviously, with the way that we're running practices with the new um, social distancing, all that sort of thing. You need to have everything ready and all your cones out and all that sort of thing. I'm there at quarter to five, putting all the cones out, making sure everything's ready, and it's just I, I just enjoy seeing the kids play. I enjoy seeing them have the fun and get better, and just it's at an age as well having done this from U7 to now U9, U10, where you see a lot of growth very quickly. And even during the last few months when the kids were off, you can see them now, the ones that have come back and have done work themselves and how how quickly they've got better um, and the, the development that, that you see in them and just the opportunity to be able to be involved in that and to to see these kids enjoying themselves and playing the game. Um, you know, I, I've... I've really thrown myself into it and it, it it's one of the highlights of my week now. And I would never, have, like you said, I would never have thought <laughs> that I would be in that position, especially as we talked about homeschooling, you know, patience isn't my strong point, but when you get on the pitch with the kids, it's almost, you just want to try and help them in any way. And instead of, instead of that impatience, it's more like a, um, a desire to just try and find a solution and find a way for one of the kids to be able to do something and get to that next level. Um, I still have problems on a game day in terms of, especially with my own kid, um, in terms of that expectation level and not trying to manage, you know, you always, you always think that everybody should be, I'm not very good when they make mistakes in games, not, you know, I, I, I've got to learn that, you know, sit back, don't say anything, you know, don't be the, as but one, listen, Luke, you're, you're just like every other parent, yeah, every I, other parent in the world I has the same challenge and it, and it is and to, you're harder to on your own your kid, child right? experience. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. A hundred percent. But the thing, yeah. the thing I learned very early on one of the coaches, uh, on one of the courses, um, it was the fundamentals was the first one I did. And they talk about, you know, you don't want to be that PlayStation coach on the side where you're you're telling the kids to do this, move here, do that, you, you know, play it, play it out here. Just let them experience it. And that was some that was one yeah. of the biggest challenges for me at the start was yeah. sit there and be quiet and then help them when they need it in, during a game. But don't be trying to tell them what to do, where to do it and how to play every k- single kick of the ball, because you want to try and you want to try and influence it, but you've got to let them make the decisions. And that's something that now two years in, I'm getting better at. I'm, I'm not all the way there yet in terms of, you know, just s- sitting back and um, letting it happen. Um, but I'm so much, so much better in that than I was back when I was starting coaching and, and trying to just trying to rather than letting them explore and find out, make the mistakes, just trying to make sure that they don't make those mistakes in the first place. And like they said, PlayStation coach telling them where to go, what to do. And I think that was probably the biggest challenge of, of all of it. Well, I know how passionate you are about the game. I know how much you love the game and, uh, and you want the kids to fall in love with it. So I'm, I'm delighted that you're involved as a grassroots coach. And, uh, I, I look forward to a generation of non-tackling right backs <laughs> with a long throw that come out of the Luke Wildman school of coaching. <laughs> Listen, we, we've, 
we, we start practice every single week with long throws down the touchline because you can never, <laughs> you might not have any skill whatsoever, but like me, if you've got a long throw, then you, you might have something. If you can hit the head of that tall kid down the front and get the flick on, then you never know. Yeah, I think we got some more work to do with you in coach education. So, <laughs> uh, Listen, Luke, I know you're really busy. Thanks very much for taking the time and uh, we'll chat again soon for sure. We've only we've only just scratched the surface of all the stories that we can tell, but this has been brilliant. A little trip down memory lane. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Jason. Excellent. Uh, when we come back, we'll wrap things up and talk about uh, what's to come in weeks ahead. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Canada Soccer Nation podcast. Uh, you probably picked up very early on that uh, Luke and I had a great relationship and and worked really well together. We had a lot of fun over the years uh, in working in broadcasting. And uh, you know, I can say it now because he's not on the call anymore, but he, he is the best in the business at what he does. An exceptional professional who's really committed to uh, delivering the highest quality broadcast when uh, when he calls a game. And, and he is a lot of fun to work with for sure. But um, plenty of great stories to share there. It hopefully gives you a little bit of insight too in, into the, the world of broadcasting and the preparation that goes into it. But then also looking at his role now as a grassroots coach and, and how that experience of, of maybe not thinking you might enjoy it when you first start, but then getting hooked and falling in love with it. It's a little bit like the story he told about his son, Hudson, who has fallen in love with playing soccer now and, and, and wants to play all the time. Coaching can certainly have that, uh, that, that same impact on people once they get, a, get an experience of what it's like. And, and I, I love the, the fact that he's also recognized he still has a lot of learning to do as a coach, which is uh, something that I think we can all say. And it's great that he's aware of that. So thanks very much to Luke for, for joining us. And to Drew Ferguson, who took some time. Dr- Drew is another one whose backstory is, is just so fascinating. And maybe we'll have to have him on in a future episode to talk a little bit more in detail about his playing career through the NASL years and and uh, and how he transitioned more into coaching. We only were able to get a, a small snapshot of that on the podcast today. Um, Brad Fugere is not with me, so I can't get his thoughts. Uh, he is off today. Uh, I'll be off next week. I've taken a couple of days to try and switch off and recharge the batteries. And uh, so we'll, we won't be having a podcast next week. And we're going to try and shift to a, a sort of bi-weekly um, podcasting uh, schedule. So every other week, we're, we're going to be aiming to put a podcast out. There's a, a lot of projects on the go at the moment uh, for both Brad and I. So going once a week is uh, proving to be a bit of a challenge for us. So we're going to shift and, and try out the every other week schedule and see how that plays out. But as always, if if you have any comments, questions, concerns, any suggestions on guests, please reach out to us at podcast at canadasoccer.com and it'll come straight to Brad and I and we'll do our best to facilitate that for you. So as always, stay safe, keep your social distancing up and look after each other. Be well and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Take care.